Let us worship God. We shall begin by singing to his praise and glory in Psalm 138. Psalm 138, and let us sing verses 1 to 6. Thee will I praise with all my heart. I will sing praise to thee before the gods and worship will toward thy sanctuary. I'll praise thy name even for thy truth and kindness of thy love. For thou thy word has magnified all thy great name above. Thou didst me answer in the day when I to thee did cry. And thou my fainting soul with strength did strengthen inwardly. All kings upon the earth that are shall give thee praise, O Lord, when as they from thy mouth shall hear thy true and faithful words. Yea, in the righteous ways of God, with gladness they shall sing, for great's the glory of the Lord, who doth forever reign. Though God be high, yet he respects all those that lowly be, whereas the proud and lofty ones are far off knoweth he so. Let us Sing to God's praise and glory, Psalm 138, verses 1 to 6. He will I praise with all
Well, let us now come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Most holy and majestic God, thou art the great creator and sustainer of all things. And it is to thee that we owe all worship and obedience. For thou made us for thyself in thine own image. Thou made us for a glorious purpose. To know thee, to walk with thee, to fill the earth and subdue it. But in our sin in Adam, we have fallen so far from that high and holy calling which thou gavest to us. And we acknowledge that we deserve to be cast off from thee forever for our squander of such privilege. How we thank thee as thy people that thou art the God who has not treated us as our sins deserve. But with that love which we can never fully comprehend, thou sent thy Son in order that he would redeem his people from all their sins. And we thank thee once more this night for all that Jesus Christ has done. And we ask that as we go forward this night and if thou sparest us into the days ahead, that he would become increasingly precious to us as we see that there is no one else who can save. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So we ask that thou wouldst fill our thoughts with Christ and that he would truly be our all and all each day. And we thank thee for that blessed remembrance of him which have afforded us this morning. We thank thee for how he by thy spirit ministers to his people as they feed upon him by faith. And we pray that we would know the, the blessing of that in the days ahead and know that closeness with him as we continue our journey through this world. This night we come with thanksgiving for all thy goodness to us, acknowledging that every good and every perfect gift is from above. And so we thank thee for thy many blessings which thou bestowest upon us each day and all thy provision for us, for the food upon our tables, for the money in our bank accounts, for our homes, for our employment, for the blessing of family and friendship and the communities we live in. We thank thee that we never have to worry about anything. The hairs on our heads are numbered. Thou takest care of the birds of the air and adorn the lilies of the field with such beauty. And how much more, more value are we. Help us to remember this and forgive us when in those times we doubt thee. And we think that there is some situation in our lives that is out with thy hands and thy control. How often we doubt so quickly as soon as thy providences are unexpected and we rest not on all thy 
many glorious promises. And so we thank thee for every good gift that thou hast given to us. And we pray that each day our hearts would be lifted up to thee in love and joyful thanksgiving. And that thou wouldst help us in our walk with thee. We confess how easily we become distracted and how our hearts get so taken up with the things of this world which have no lasting value but we are guilty of pouring so much time and energy into things that we will not have in eternity when there are things of eternal value that are so much more precious that we must focus more upon. We pray then that this communion time would be a reset in our hearts and minds for all of us and that we would learn to prioritize what is truly needful we thank thee for gathering us here this night and we pray that we would come seeing what a privilege it is to once again enter the house of God and that thou wouldst humble us before thee and that thou wouldst be pleased to speak powerfully to us through thy word that has commanded us to open our mouths and thou will fill them and so help us to come in faith like this yearning for closer communion with our god longing to meet with thee please be gracious please come down with power and may we know that blessing of thy presence may we know a, a stillness and a holy hush as we attend upon thy word and may thou be pleased to indeed meet with us therein and show us more of thy glorious self. We ask then that thou wouldst pardon all our sins and speak to the believer and the unbeliever here tonight that we would be enabled to see thy risen son, the Lord Jesus, in all his beauty and glory and that truly we would find rest for our souls in him. So please hear our prayers and continue with us now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For our scripture reading this evening, please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke and to chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we shall begin reading at verse 18. And we shall read through the first 10 of chapter 19. So Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 18. Let us hear the word of God. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is, God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye 
than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave, gave praise unto God. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste. And came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. And may God bless to us in the reading of his word. Let us now sing in Psalm 40. Psalm 40, and let us sing verses 1 to 5. Psalm 40, we shall sing the opening six stanzas, verses 1 to 5. I waited for the Lord my God, and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice, and cry to hear. He took me from a fearful pit and from the miry clay, and on a rock he set my feet, establishing my way. He put a new song in my mouth, our God to magnify. Many shall see it and shall fear, and on the Lord rely. O oh, blessed is the man whose trust upon the Lord relies, 
respecting not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. O Lord my God, full many are the wonders thou hast done. Thy gracious thoughts to usward far above all thoughts are gone. In order none can reckon them to thee. If them declare, and speak of them I would, they more than can be numbered are. So we shall sing to God's praise Psalm 40 verses 1 to 5. I waited for the Please do turn again to where we read in the Gospel according to Luke and began reading in chapter 18 but it is the first 10 verses of chapter 19 where our focus is going to be this evening and we look to God to help us as we look at this meeting. What do you make of Zacchaeus? Was he a rich man who became poor? Or was he a poor man who became rich? And how you answer that question 
reveal, reveals a lot about you. It shows where you are spiritually. It shows what you truly value. We're told in verse 2 that Zacchaeus was rich, meaning that he had a lot of money. We'll come on to how he acquired much of that money. But he had a lot of money. And then he met Jesus Christ. And he became a lifelong disciple of Jesus Christ. How do we know that? He's never mentioned again in the Bible. Well, we're told in verse 9 that Jesus declares that salvation came to his house. So he became a true follower of Jesus Christ. And then he gave away half his goods to the poor. And then he paid back four times as much to those he had stolen from. So, what do you make of Zacchaeus? Was he a rich man who became poor? Or was he a poor man who became rich? What Jesus does in the life of Zacchaeus shows the truth of chapter 18, verse 27. Because you see, we've read of two rich men that met Jesus. But there's a huge difference between them. We see with the rich young ruler that we read of at first that his riches were most dear to him and he couldn't truly follow the Lord. The Lord therefore put him to the test and said if you want to follow me you'll have to give away what you have on income because the Lord knew his heart. And God doesn't take second place in the lives of his people. Second place is an affront and a mockery to the creator of the universe. And so, in the aftermath of the rich young ruler going away sorrowful, Jesus declares in verse 24, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And isn't it true that men are so taken up with money and possession and things in this world. It's what they live for. It's what the natural man craves. And so the disciples ask in response in verse 26, who then shall, can be saved? And Jesus declares in verse 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. God can so change the heart that the riches lose their shine and cause these people to discover that there's so much more to be had than things. Friends, there will be many people in heaven who in this life had a lot of money, a lot of possessions. And there'll be many people in heaven who were less well off materially in this life. But the same is true for the other place. There will also be many in hell who had much in this life and their riches prevented them entering the kingdom of God. And likewise, there will be many in hell who were poor in this life and actually they're seeking after riches prevented them entering kingdom. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Paul's saying it's a problem for believers. It can be such a hindrance and a stumbling block for believers as well as being a distraction for unbelievers. 
that, humanly speaking, keeps them on that road to destruction. So we're told that this meeting between Jesus and Zacchaeus took place in Jericho. Jericho was a wealthy town. Much trade passed through this town and therefore the Romans saw it expedient to set up a customs post there and make sure that the goods passing through and trade being traded were taxed and this required quite a number of tax collectors and the tax collectors were organised so that there was would be those that looked after them, their managers, their bosses. And this, it appears, is what Zacchaeus was. Verse 2 tells us he was the chief among the publicans in this place. And we see that before meeting Jesus, he had questionable morals. Being a tax collector was an easy way to line your own pockets. You could set the rates and put them a bit higher and take what you wanted for yourself as well. So this was the background of this man, Zacchaeus. But what we see in the Lord's dealing with him is that past sins don't disqualify someone from coming and having life in Jesus Christ. My friend, your past sins don't write you off. Your past sins don't mean that the gospel is offered to everyone except you. You're not the exception. Whatever you've done, whoever you are, whatever your background, there's good news. Good news proclaimed to you. Good news that you're urged to take heed of. A saviour you're urged to take hold of. We see that Zacchaeus knew deep down that his life was empty. Being a chief tax collector was a good, well-paid job anyway. But that wasn't enough for him. He needed to cheat as well. Trying to acquire all the wealth he could. Lost his reputation among his own people, the Jews, doing so, who had no time for those that would work for the Romans. He wasn't satisfied. He was looking for more. And the fact that he went to see who was passing through the town and what was drawing the crowd shows he was looking for something. Something that money couldn't give him. And then meeting Jesus Christ, he found something that money could never give him. As Augustine famously said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in me. Is you're still restless this night? Are you still wandering from pillar to post in this world, looking for the next thing, the next buzz, the next thing that's going to captivate your attention, give you something to devote your energy to for a little while? And it won't last either, like nothing before did, because you were made for something so much greater. You were made to know God. You were made to have fellowship with your creator. So Zacchaeus is a rich man, a dissatisfied man, and most likely, in many ways, a lonely man, hated and despised by his community, as is evidenced in verse 7, where when The Lord goes to his home. The people are saying, they're murmuring, saying he's gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. He was looked down upon. He was frowned upon and despised by society. And in many ways, Zacchaeus gave them good reason to. But he was a man who was precious to Jesus Christ. Meaning what? Well, meaning that Jesus did something for him. You see, in the final verse we read, in verse 10 of chapter 19, Jesus tells us what he was doing. 
in this whole incident with Zacchaeus. But the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what Jesus was doing in the life of Zacchaeus. And that's what he's done in the lives of all his people. He's come to seek and to save. And we're going to briefly consider the, these two headings then. Jesus seeking and Jesus saving. I think there's a good case to be made that this man Zacchaeus wasn't really seeking Jesus. But Jesus was seeking him. I think it's likely he saw the commotion in the town. The crowds were all going out to see who was passing through. And it might well just have been curiosity that led him to go with the crowd. And then naturally being unable to see because of his height, he climbs the tree. He had the hope of something better. The hope of something new that day. It's unlikely he was seeking Jesus in any spiritual way, but perhaps he'd heard of him. Perhaps the stories had spread of this teacher. But he went. And ultimately it's Jesus that took the initiative. The Lord called him down from the tree because the Lord was seeking him. Just as in the garden, after they had sinned and eaten the forbidden fruit, the Lord came seeking Adam and Eve to cover them, to give them a gospel promise. That's what Jesus Christ does. That's what he's doing now. He's seeking. He's seeking his people. He has sheep to be gathered in. And in love he comes. He's working now in this world. From his throne in heaven he is working. By his Holy Spirit. Working through the ministry of his church. Because he is a people. A people to call to himself. It wasn't the custom to invite yourself to someone's home. But Jesus does that. It implies he was going to eat with him. He was coming to stay there. He came and he took over a home and a heart. And the question is, has he taken over yours? He stands at the door and knocks. And have you surrendered all to him? Zacchaeus came in the midst of many frowns and murmurings. He came. The Lord drew him. My friend, if you're still halting between two opinions, if you're still unsure, and part, perhaps part of it is love of the world, fear of man, fear of your reputation, forget what the crowd think of you and come to Jesus Christ. It was Martin Luther who said, I fear not what men Think of me, I fear not man's opinions, they shall be eaten by worms. The people you're most trying to impress, the people you think it's most important to be on their side, the people you're <coughs> terrified will think so badly of you, if you would take hold of the Saviour. My friend, these people are dying, and their opinions will die with them. What really matters is what God thinks of you. What matters is the relation you stand with the judge of all the earth and you're going to stand before him one day. And without Christ, you're not ready. You're not in a righteous state. You're still in your sins. 
And if you die in your sins, you'll be punished eternally for them. But Jesus Christ is offered. He alone can make you right with God. And he promises to do that for all who will call upon him in sincerity. Jesus Christ has died for his people. He's made full atonement for their sins at the cross of Calvary. And he now seeks them out by his spirit. The Lord is building his church now. He directs the providences of all his people and they will encounter him. Some early on, some later. It's not always a Damascus Road experience. But through perhaps being given a Bible or a tract or reading about him. By coming to church and hearing about him. The Lord will gather in his bride. He comes to seek in order to save And we might find there's opposition, as I've said, from the world, perhaps from the church. But Zacchaeus comes, we see in verse 6, a joy marked his life now. He received Jesus joyfully. But he knew there were things he had to change. He knew he couldn't go on in good conscience with the Lord what he'd done and the proof of his genuine conversion is that there was a personal particular repentance evidenced by his works 2 Corinthians 5 17 therefore if any man is in Christ he is a new creation old things have passed away behold all things have become new because you see, when Jesus Christ meets with you, he searches you. He searches you, he brings, he draws that confession of sin out of you. He brings you to repentance and he brings your life into reformation where it is required. Zacchaeus saw change had to be made. What needs to change in your life today? In light of who Jesus Christ is, in what ways can you not go on? Things you can no longer do. Things you've not been doing that need to come in for your walk with him. Is there even restitution that has to be made as there was for Zacchaeus? Have you charged too much for work? Have you overpriced something? Have you not given to your employer? What's due to them, the hours, the work? Have you dodged taxes? Is there someone you've not treated well? An apology must be made. Forgiveness must be sought. Anything in your life contrary to God's law and Christ's commands? Anything that doesn't sit right with being a Christian has to go. My friend, if you're clinging on to anything tonight, your Christian life will be hampered. It will be stunted. The joy will be sucked out of it. And you'll find there's not a power there. In your witness, in your prayer, if you seek to cling to sin and idols. Zacchaeus couldn't go on. His conscience wouldn't allow him to. He'd done wrong and he was able to put things right. And actually, we see how much grace had transformed his life by the fact that he went way beyond what the law required. The law required that if someone had cheated someone or stolen from them, they were required to make full restitution, pay the full amount back plus one fifth. So they pay back the full amount and add on 20% to make up for the other person's loss. Zacchaeus made fourfold restitution, way beyond what the law required, and then he gave half of his goods away. Just as he freely received, he freely gave. He saw what was truly important. 
He also saw the need around him in that way in giving to the poor. And friend, the reality is when you come to love the Saviour, you come to love people. Don't you? When you come to love the Saviour, you can't help but love his people. And we know that we've passed from death to life. We love the brethren. Those Christ dwells within. Those that are part of your family now. You love them. But of course you love the lost as well because you see that's where you once were. And your heart's filled with pity and compassion. For those who haven't tasted, haven't been brought in as you have been. And so for Zacchaeus we see he has a new heart. That loves the Lord, that loves people around him. Money's no longer his God. His change of attitude towards it reveals a change of heart. He lived out the verse that we find in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. The rich young ruler was unwilling to part with his wealth. But by grace, Zacchaeus was more than happy to. Why won't you surrender all to Jesus Christ this night? What's stopping you? What's got that, that pull on you, that grip, that hold on you that makes you think, no, I've got something better elsewhere? What makes you think it's not worth it to have Christ? Friends, whatever you think is worth not having Christ for, if you go on in this way, you'll discover in hell that it wasn't worth it. You'll burn eternally, you'll be tormented, and it will never end. I know we can't measure eternity in terms of time, but it's always given me a chill to think that for those in hell, there's no halfway point. You never reach halfway. However long someone will be there for, there's always longer to go. Eternity never ends. Of course, the same is true for heaven. That when we've been there for ages and ages and have come to such discoveries of our beloved that we never knew on this earth, there's even longer to go. Heaven will never end either. We'll never reach halfway there. All that lies ahead for believers after they've been there. As John Newton said, 10,000 years. No less days, they even more ahead of beholding their king, walking with him and being taken deeper into his heart. And this is what Zacchaeus discovered. By the grace of God. And so Jesus describes him in verse 9 as now being a son of Abraham. And there's two ways in which Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. First of all, tax collectors were treated as traitors who could no longer be called Jews. But Jesus is saying, no, this man's still a Jew. I came for the likes of him. And he has as much entitlement to hear the gospel as any other. But secondly, he's a son of Abraham because he's a child of faith. As Paul speaks of in Romans 4. Not just those of the circumcision. 
not just the biological Jew, but also those spiritually of faith. So in Galatians 3, 7, Paul says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And so what Jesus did here is what he still continues to do today. There is one who is now about the business of seeking and saving the lost. He puts out the gospel call. He draws effectually by his spirit and he gathers. My friends, what we see from the Lord meeting Zacchaeus is that there is a willingness in Jesus Christ to save sinners. It is his joy to do so. And if you come to him, you won't find him saving you begrudgingly. You won't find him doing it through gritted teeth. No, it will be his delight to do so. And he does so sovereignly. And you think, is it God's sovereign plan of salvation to have me? Am I one of the elect? Am I one that he has sought out? Well, your coming to him is evidence that he has been seeking you. You can't come on your own. You can't come by your own strength. Jesus said that all that the Father gives me will come to me. None can come except the Father draw them. So how do you know you, you come? That's the call to you. That's your business. God's electing purposes. His working sovereignly by his spirit. That's, that's his. The call to you is to come. To surrender all to Jesus Christ. To trust in his death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life. Those that do come have answered his call. And they've only come because he's been seeking them first. So the question for you is, have I come? Have you been found by him? Do you want to be? Do you want to be found by Jesus Christ? Do you want your life to be taken up by him? Do you want to know him and know God through him? Do you want eternity in his presence? Do you want freedom from the power of sin? To walk a new holy life knowing God? My friends, it's offered to you. The offer is to you. So what will you do with this call? So what do you make of Zacchaeus? Was he a rich man who became poor? Or was he a poor man who became rich? I hope that by God's grace we all would give the answer of the latter. We see what's truly important. Zacchaeus was just a poor man who cares how much money he has in the end. But he became rich in coming to know and follow Jesus Christ. So what does that make you tonight? Are you poor? Or are you rich? The answer to that ultimately, in terms of eternity, has got nothing to do with your bank account or your assets and everything to do with the relation in which you stand to the Lord of glory. And my friend, he is offered to you. Let us pray. Almighty God, how wondrous is thy love for sinners. How amazing is thy plan of salvation and the good news of thy son crucified and risen and we ask for all here tonight that the grace would be given to close in with him and to know that abundant life 
in him, that life in all its fullness. Please work by thy sovereign power. Oh, that hearts would be melted, seeing the love of the Savior for his people, a love shown in his wounds, in his dying in agony at Calvary to redeem them. So this night we commit ourselves into thy hands, asking that thou would help us to think upon these things and that our lives would be ordered aright, that we would prioritize the things of eternity and that we would come to know the Savior more as we walk on with him. We ask thy richest blessing to be upon this congregation we pray for the community around that they would be here a bright and shining light, a city set on a hill. And we pray for every true gospel congregation on this island that thou wouldst be pleased to, might, to work mightily in these days to bring about reviving power, that people would come flocking to hear the good news of the Saviour, that there would be that conviction there would be that earnestness and urgency as people consider the great weighty matters of eternity. Please work by thy spirit, we ask, to bring blessing, to bring a harvest of souls for the glory of thy name. And so we pray for thy ministers and preachers in this place. I was, they would know thy help and strength and protection for their own hearts and their families in the days ahead. Living God, we give thee thanks for thy word this night and ask that thou wouldst work by it. And we thank thee that it will not return to thee void. Please go before us, pardon our sins, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us conclude this evening by singing to God's praise in Psalm 63. Psalm 63, and let us sing from verse 1 to verse 8. Lord, thee my God, I'll early seek. My soul doth thirst for thee. My flesh longs in a dry parched land, wherein no waters be, that I thy power may behold. And brightness of thy face, as I have seen thee heretofore within thy holy place. Since better is thy love than life, my lips thee praise shall give. I in thy name will lift my hands and bless thee while I live. Even as with marrow and with fat, my soul shall fill thee. Then shall my mouth with joyful lips sing praises unto thee. When I do thee upon my bed, remember with delight. And when on thee I meditate in watches of the night, in shadow of thy wings I'll joy. For thou mine help hast been, my soul thee follows hard, and me thy right hand doth sustain. May we leave this place tonight and go on in the truth of verse 8, that our souls would follow hard after the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us sing to God's praise, Psalm 63, verses 1 to 8. Lord, be my God, I'll early seek, my soul doth thirst for thee. Lord, thee, my God, I
Well, friends, immediately after the service just now, there'll be a fellowship in the hall to which you are all warmly invited. Looking ahead to tomorrow, the Thanksgiving service at 11 a.m., and the collection tomorrow will go to the work of Hudson Taylor Ministries. The midweek prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Service the next Lord's Day at uh, the usual times. Uh, however, I shall not be here. I expect to be assisting at the Aran communion season uh, over this coming week, and Mr. Alistair Patterson will conduct the services here. Now, for Portree, um, uh, the same applies. It's services as usual, Wednesday at 7, and next Lord's Day 11 and 6.30. Mr. Baxter. Now for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.